Good morning, Asian patrons of the Vatican Museums, and welcome to the third part of our lecture series on Raphael and his world. Uh, this one is entitled The Elusive Leonardo. And in the other two lectures, we had already gotten into the heart of Raphael, Raphael's conflict with Michelangelo, his work in the Vatican Museums. And uh, then we talked about Raphael's death, the spectacular five years of his life when he was incredibly busy and in, 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 in producing many, many, many innovative works. But now we back up in time and we meet a young Raphael and we look at the influences, this extraordinary age, these, these remarkable figures that created the terroir that allowed such a unique fruit, such an extraordinary vintage as Raphael to flourish. And so today we'll be talking about Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, who is something of an elusive figure. We've had a big show on him. Last year was the 500th anniversary of the death of Leonardo da Vinci. But even as these new biographies, these huge ex exhibitions come out, there's always this sense of this elusive quality of understanding exactly what kind of man Leonardo was. And that has a great deal to do with his reputation as a polymath, the fact that he was involved in so many things. His mind, his attentions, his activities wandered and ranged over so many different subjects subjects, he's very hard to pin down. Not so with Raphael. Raphael will be someone who decides to be an artist and he will put all of his energies into creating art, as we see of many kinds, but Raphael is fundamentally, primarily, always an artist and in particular a painter. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Liz Lev. I've had the joy of, of guiding many of your chapter trips here in Rome, and I'd like to thank Ben Chang for making this possible, this wonderful opportunity for us to talk about these great Italian artists and particularly their role in the Vatican Museums and um, and the role that the patrons have in making sure that their works are accessible, conserved, and, 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 and beautiful even today. So let's get started and get back to the very beginning of Raphael, who was born on March 28th of 1483 in a little town called Urbino. This image you see here is from the Gallery of the Maps in the Vatican Museum. Urbino, not Florence or Venice or Rome, was actually at the time not as big as those other major centers, and yet Urbino was a very bustling and busy town. It was led by Federico di Montefeltro, a kind of uh, warrior turned Duke, and he put together a very interesting court of great humanists and very exciting painters. So he brought painters in from all over Europe, not just Italians, but he brought them all together to really create a very rich and varied uh, artistic milieu around this tiny and really exquisite little hill town. Raphael was born here to a painter. So unlike Michelangelo, unlike Leonardo, whose families have different backgrounds, Raphael was born into an artistic family. His father was a painter and ran a busy and successful studio in, in Urbino. You can still see the house that Giovanni Sanzio lived in. And as you can see from the painting of St. Jerome here, which is contained in the Vatican Museums, he was not going to ever be one of the great cutting edge, avant-garde, exciting artists of the 15th century. He was an adequate painter. He did, he did well in the Urbino court, but he was never going to reach the heights of some of the other painters. But he did teach Raphael how to run a studio, how to organize the work, how to fulfill orders, how to grow Rind pigments, you can see in the little house of Raphael, the stone where the young boy, nine years old when he started working with his father, learned to grind pigments. For the history of art, the greatest thing that Giovanni Sanzio left us was a poem. Here you see the remains of a rhymed chronicle involving a, an event that took place in Urbino. And he took advantage, Giovanni Sanzio, in recounting this event in Urbino 
to list the greatest painters of the age. And so in there, we see the names by a fellow artist looking around at the artistic landscape of the 15th century saying, these guys, Botticelli, Lippi, Eustace, Signorelli, very interested not only in the older masters, but in the up and coming new masters. And in this rhyme, in this poem, he singles out two artists. One is, they're both young when this was written. So this was written in um, about 1470. So these, these men are about 20 years old at the time. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Pietro Perugino. And so these two artists are held up above all others. Pietro Perugino will actually assist young Raphael as he takes his first steps as an artist. And Leonardo da Vinci, of course, is going to be a major influence on the life of Raphael. What is interesting is that these two painters actually started out in the same studio. They were apprenticed, young upcoming artists learning the trade in the studio of Verrocchio. Verrocchio, kind of an unsung hero of the Italian Renaissance, ran a Florentine studio where he produced paintings, sculptures, uh, virtually anything artistic you needed, you could go to Verrocchio's studio. And in that milieu, we already see a very innovative artist. This portrait of an unknown woman here breaks the mold in portraiture. It shows the woman's hands, these female portrait busts, which are already very rare, just sort of stopped right underneath the neck. But Verrocchio is daring to show the hands holding the flower, that sort of dreamy expression on her face. She, her her pupils aren't, aren't carved in, but she seems to have a dreamy expression. We're invited to think about what she's thinking about. And that image and that work of art will stay with our Leonardo da Vinci when he produces his most famous portrait, the Mona Lisa. Verrocchio was also a man who went after this, this famous image of Florence. Florence's favorite image was David. They saw themselves, and this, the Republic of Florence saw itself like the young hero. And in Verrocchio's version of David, we have the young, wiry boy. We see a sculptor who's fascinated by the beauty of the human body, creating these taut muscles of this strong, energetic young man. But physically, the sculpture is about four feet tall, clearly in no position to defeat the enormous and all powerful Goliath. And the other very interesting work that appeared in the studio of Verrocchio shows us already Leonardo da Vinci's very distinctive traits. Uh, Verrocchio was producing a uh, baptism of Christ. And you can see the figures on, on the right, the image of Jesus and the image of John the Baptist are very much out of the Verrocchio playbook. He was clearly very interested in painting John the Baptist, the emaciated uh, figure who fasts in the desert with the visible ribs and the taut muscles leaning towards Jesus as he baptizes him. But at this point, Verrocchio's studio was very busy. And so uh, he decided to call upon the assistance of one of his young apprentices. And in the lower left-hand corner, Leonardo da Vinci painted the angel. You see the angel who is kneeling with its back to you. It's turned towards the side with a softness. And this is a 17, 18-year-old Leonardo da Vinci. And he paints with this softness. The angel really does look like an unearthly creature that has come to join this painting from some mysterious place. And even the angel painted by Verrocchio, instead of gazing at Jesus, Verrocchio's angel gazes at Leonardo's angel, almost as if to say, where did you come from? And it's believed that once Verrocchio saw the incredible capabilities of young Leonardo, the Verrocchio gave up painting and basically gave the work over to his young apprentice, Leonardo. And the most important project that Verrocchio was working on, which would also have an impact in the life of Leonardo, is the image of the bronze equestrian monument to Bartolomeo Colleone, which is in Venice outside the Dominican church known as Zanipolo, or dedicated to Giovanni and Paolo. 
this mighty, mighty equestrian statue based on the famous equestrian statue on the Capitoline Hill here in Rome, our Marcus Aurelius from the second century AD, had already been uh, uh, reproduced in a certain sense in Padova by Donatello when he made the Gattamelata statue. And Verrocchio takes on that tradition of gigantic bronze equestrian statues in the manner of ant antiquity with the raised hoof when he made the, 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 the Corleone monument. And young Leonardo da Vinci was in on this project. So when we see Leonardo later on looking to sell his skills elsewhere, the ability or the knowledge or the intimate workings of how to make a bronze equestrian statue will be a very important part of Leonardo's uh, launch, as it were. So Raphael traveled a relatively short distance. It was 110 kilometers. It says here miles, but it's actually 68 miles, 110 kilometers. So he went from Urbino to Florence. He went to Florence in about 1503, 1504, most likely. And he arrived in Florence shortly after the triumphant return of A, Leonardo da Vinci, and B, Michelangelo. Raphael walked into the exceptional city of Florence, already the Republic of Florence, which had produced so many amazing artists from Brunelleschi's Dome to Ghiberti's Doors of Paradise to Donatello's work. It was already a haven for art. And it was undergoing another major transformation by the presence of the two greatest living artists, Leonardo and Michelangelo, in the same town, back in their hometown for the first time. And so Raphael comes into that world and immediately starts to drink deeply at the fountain of inspiration, which is Leonardo da Vinci. Now, Leonardo da Vinci had been gone from Florence for many years. He had a beautiful image of the Duomo, so the, 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 the Raphael become part of this community that lives under the shadow of Brunelleschi's dome. Leonardo had returned from Florence, where he had lived for about 18 years. It is very likely that Leonardo's decision to move to Florence was, was, was motivated by a lack of desire to open a studio. He came from the studio of Verrocchio, and the customary behavior of artists in Florence was to open a studio, which means you are at the beck and call of a patron, you have to run a business, you have to keep accounts, you have to organize apprentices, you have to take commissions, you have to fight for commissions with the other great artists of Florence. And it is my belief that Leonardo did not want to live as a craftsman. He didn't want to have to be a businessman. And so he searched for the possibility to find himself in a court that would appreciate his talents, but leave him enough free time to cultivate some of his other interests. It was kind of like he was looking for a fellowship. He didn't want to go straight into working. He wanted to find a fellowship so that he could be sponsored to continue his, his, his growth. And so he presented himself in the court of Milan in 1482. He brought with him, a, he, brought, he sent a letter describing his skills. And in it, he really doesn't mention painting skills. He talks about his ability to work on engineering projects. And here you see one of his water plans. He will indeed do a lot of work for the canals of Milan. Then he was also involved in religious painting, but not just devotional painting. He worked on religious paintings that were trying to illustrate through images some of the complicated doctrinal questions of its time. So the Virgin of the Rocks, which what, there's a copy in London and a version in Paris, this is actually a very complex painting dealing with ideas of the Immaculate Conception. We also have Leonardo looking for free time to work on his own projects, to do his dissections, to think, to study nature to speculate about the nature of painting and the nature of the world itself. So Leonardo, really a kind of philosopher, a lover of knowledge, trying to learn as much as possible in the time he had in his court. And of course, he was busy doing court things like doing portraits of the family and decorating portraits of friends and family and decorating the various halls. 
And he was also counted on for amusement. This is a copy, I believe this is a constructed copy of the lyre that Leonardo built, apparently made out of silver, brought to Milan and performed personally music for Ludwig the Moor, the Duke of Milan. But what he really had promised the Duke of Milan was an equestrian statue. And he promised that he would make a statue of Ludovico's father, Francesco Sforza, on the rearing horse, uh, trampling his enemies. So already looking at what the Romans had done with Marcus Aurelius, the horse with the, 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 the positioning of the horse with its hooves, except for one on the ground. Then to Donatello, then to Verrocchio, Leonardo planned on doing a horse rearing on its hind legs, something that had never been done before. So very, very, very ambitious plans. And that same grand vision of trying to push the boundaries of art where they had never been before were present when he returned to Florence. So when Raphael arrived in Florence, what could he see of this legendary Leonardo da Vinci? There were three paintings. One had already been produced. When Leonardo left for Milan, he was in the middle of doing the painting of the Adoration of the Magi, which you see on the left. It is a work that he never completed. He ended up going to Milan and leaving the work incomplete. But these incomplete Leonardo works were often left out so that other artists would be able to learn from them. They become a kind of font of knowledge for future artists. And in particular, what Raphael is learning from them is the grouping of this circle around Mary and Jesus. So you have Mary and Jesus in the middle and all the figures group around in a circle. It's like watching a whirlpool and Mary and Jesus are at the center and the water is whirling around in the form of these faces and creating this sense of this yearning as the figures lean and reach towards the center, which is going to be sort of a signature in, uh, in, in Raphael's later work. Uh, in the background, you can see horses. Leonardo truly prided himself on being extraordinarily gifted at representing horses. And we will see later on how that figures, but it's also important for Raphael, who will in a certain sense, as we said last week, sign uh, one of the, the second room he does for Julius II, uh, the expulsion of Attila the Hun. He will sort of sign it with a pair of horsemen, kind of showing himself fully the heir of Leonardo da Vinci. The center portrait, of course, is the most important portrait Leonardo will undertake, the Mona Lisa, which you know is in Paris, but at the time it was being painted in Florence. It was the work for a wealthy businessman. He wanted his portrait of his wife painted. And so this portrait was being undertaken as Raphael came to Florence. It was being done in Leonardo's studio. And it's a work that people were talking about almost immediately. And then the last one, the Virgin Child and Saint Anne, uh, also known as the Saint Anne Materza, is another work of art that Leonardo produced in Florence thinking about how to group figures together. It is a very common image in Florence and Italy, really, the Holy Family. Joseph, Mary, Jesus. Mary, Jesus, John the Baptist. Mary, her mother, Anne, which you see here, and baby Jesus or Joseph. So trying to group three, four figures together in this image of the Holy Family. In the case of the Virgin and Child in St. Anne, Leonardo comes up with a rather striking change. St. Anne sits straight in the back and Mary zigzags in the lap of Anne and it creates a much more dynamic energy where then Mary reaches down for the baby Jesus who in turn is kind of straddling the lamb. So we have this one line, we have this interesting zigzag and it creates a much more kinetic energy to the work. It's not just a placid image of the Madonna and child, it's something that has a life, an energy of its own. 
The other thing that Leonardo was doing during his time in Florence was talking a lot about painting. At this point, Leonardo in 15, in 1599, I'm sorry, in 1499, uh, 1500, uh, Leonardo was almost 50 years old. He had a lifetime of experience of painting. He was incredibly successful in, in, in the works he had produced. And he starts thinking about passing on his knowledge. And show, so he shares a lot of reflections about art in what will eventually be known as his treatise on painting. And he uh, also spends some time critiquing other artists. And uh, he's not very subtle, nor is he uh, delicate in his critique of other artists. When he discusses an enunciation he saw by a nameless other painter, he says, the angel seemed to want to scare Our Lady out of the room with his brusque movements. And that Our Lady seemed so desperate, she wanted to throw herself out the window. And even though he doesn't specify the artist, I have taken the liberty of proposing who I think the artist might be, uh, Sandro Botticelli, who is an artist who studied in the same studio of Verrocchio as Leonardo, the only artist Leonardo ever mentions in all of his writings. And when he mentions it, it's to complain about Botticelli's style. So I think perhaps uh, Leonardo was taking a swipe at the closest competitor he had in painting, Botticelli, for his somewhat unusual and less naturalistic style. The other thing that Leonardo took a swipe at was the art of sculpture. And again, I will repeat something that I talked about last week, two weeks ago in the Clash of the Titans. There is a real battle taking place between the late 15th and the early 16th century between the art of painting and the art of sculpture. As I have said, they are both considered manual arts, i.e. crafts, where the artist or the worker producing a work of art uses his hands more than his mind. The battle that is taking place, and Leonardo is a key figure in these efforts is to have painters or sculptors or both recognized as thinkers as well as craftsmen. And so when Leonardo talks about sculpture in these terms, the sculptor in practicing his art uses the force of his arm He's talking about something that's mechanical. He's hitting something with this concussion and this very mechanical exercise. And the dust from his efforts flies in the air, lands on the sweaty, a sweaty sculptor who ends up looking like a baker. Now, it's a very dismissive way of discussing that art into something that looks like a, a sculptor is not much different from a plumber, a baker. And so, and on top of everything else, in Florence in 1504, when Leonardo says these words, everyone knows who he's talking about. He's talking about the greatest living sculptor who has finished making the Pietà and has just finished making the David. He's talking about Michelangelo. So it's very evident that this rivalry between painting and sculpture is very much alive in Florence and its two great spokespeople are Leonardo and Michelangelo. And in true Florentine fashion, the Florentines decided to make the two compete, to put their money where their mouths were or put their brushes where their mouths were. And they chose the room of the Cinquecento where the 500 representatives of the Florentine government would meet inside the Florentine city hall. And Michelangelo would paint one wall, Leonardo would paint the other wall, and the Florentines could decide themselves which is the greatest artist, who is the greatest artist, the most, that was supposed to be the most exciting clash of the titans of all time. Michelangelo and Raphael took the project seriously. Leonardo preparing drawings for the Battle of Anghiari, a famous Florentine victory, where you see a horse battle taking place. And these tight knot of interwoven horses, again, looking like that water motif. Again, you're looking at something that looks like a whirlpool, swirling and twisting, this intensity of composition, very much Leonardo's forte, especially emphasizing his ability to represent animals. 
Michelangelo, on the other hand, chose the subject matter of the Battle of Cascina, which is a battle which came upon Florentine soldiers unexpectedly while they were playing, they were swimming in the Arno one day, and in the midst of their nice little swim, uh, they saw the approaching enemy, they have to jump out of the water, get on their uniforms, and then go to battle. Perfect scene for Michelangelo, showing the human body in various states of undress, various positions. We see them coming out of the water, we see them gathering, we see them getting ready to rush off. Michelangelo playing to his sculptural roots by showing this incredible series of variations on the human body. But that competition was never to be completed. And that was because Leonardo would end up, Leonardo would end up with other projects and Michelangelo would be called to Rome in 1505. And so this much anticipated competition, this very exciting uh, showdown between painting and sculpture that was supposed to take place in Florence ended up taking place in Rome between Michelangelo and Raphael. When Raphael walked into that room to see the cartoons by Leonardo and Michelangelo, we wonder, did he know that within a few short years, he would be the artist carrying the mantle, carrying the torch for painting against the mighty Michelangelo? But in the meantime, before he went to take on this task, he was learning, and he was learning as fast as he possibly could. He was looking at everything available by Leonardo da Vinci and learning some of the exciting techniques that Leonardo was producing. On the right, you see, of course, the famous Mona Lisa, in which Leonardo revolutionized portrait painting. He did it in several ways. One is the use of the hands in the portrait together with the face. So we have Lisa's hands, one sitting on top of the other. And it appears like it's a very placid and calm gesture until you notice the energy of the fingers underneath lifting. So it feels a little bit like the subduing of the personality as she sits for the artist who is trying to penetrate into her innermost self. And the second thing about the work, the figure looks at you. It was unusual for female figures to look into, look at portrait artists. Female figures would look to the side or with their eyes downcast. But a three-quarter view with the figure looking at you creates a slightly unsettling duel between you and the sitter as you try to look at the sitter, try to visually possess the sitter, and the sitter becomes elusive by hiding her expression. So Leonardo III used a new technique for this portrait, a technique that was called sfumato. It involved blurring the corners of her eyes and the corners of her lips. At times he will blur with his own fingertips, not just with a paintbrush, but you can actually see in a later painting, we'll talk about how you can see his fingertips where he, he, he blurred the, um, the edges. And in doing that, he creates a mystery, a mystery expression on the sides of her face. It's hard to see because it's just the two corners that would tell you what her expression is are actually hidden from you. The softness of the skin, the beautiful, the sfumato creates a kind of blurriness, the way the hair falls so lightly. Raphael will, will, will learn that technique very, very quickly. The other thing that Leonardo did was he created a mysterious landscape behind Mona Lisa, and it adds to our fascination with this figure. Because as we look into the landscape, whether or not we realize it, the landscape is telling us something. When we look beyond the figure, we look for the setting to try to recognize and gain information about what we're looking at by looking at the setting. And by giving us a setting that is familiar, we understand that there are rocks and there's a road and there's some water, but at the same time, extremely mysterious. It's a very, uh, uh, it creates not a sense of understanding this woman better, but it creates a sense of adding to the mystery of this woman. We look in the background and we just see something that is unnavigable, un unchartable. 
And that is part of what makes this figure so incredible. If you're against a blank background or a black background or just a pretty little landscape on the left, she'd be a much more approachable figure. But part of the marvelous mystery of, of Mona Lisa comes from the questions that Leonardo leaves in the painting, as opposed to the answers that most artists give. So Raphael sees these technical, these technical changes, realizes that there's just an incredible opportunity for revolutionizing particularly female portraiture here. But honestly, most women don't really want to be portrayed the way Mona Lisa is. And as a matter of fact, Leonardo will never turn that painting over to the patron who paid for it. Leonardo will bring it with him to France. It probably has to do with tensions regarding that wasn't the way I really wanted my white portrait. On the left hand side you see Raphael making a user-friendly version of Mona Lisa. He keeps the hands which are very placid. He keeps the three-quarter portrait and he has the figure who looks out at you with a slight sfumato around the edges of the eyes. But the fact is he goes to a lot of trouble to portray things like the jewel around her neck and around her fingers so that we understand the status of her husband. This is a woman who clearly, she's Madalena Strozzi is actually, Madalena Doni is actually one of the, she's, she's married to one of the wealthiest men in Florence. So you see the status of her husband in the silk, in the decoration in her jewels. Um, we also get a sense from her background that we're looking at someone who is very mild. Look at the way her shoulders fit softly into that very quiet landscape. So you have, again, the idea of a person who's very easy to get along with. And even more successfully, Raphael, a few years later, produced this portrait of a young woman who is, uh, again, probably a future bride. By this point, Raphael's ability to paint skin, that porcelain skin with the slight tinge of pink in her cheek, the individual strands of that blonde hair. Once again, a beautiful jewel around her neck framed in this crystalline blue background that gives you the idea of the sweetest, most peaceful, limpid nature. We have a very different impression of this woman on the left, thanks to her landscape, from the woman on the right, Mona Lisa. And of course, the imagery of a woman holding a unicorn is always an image of virginity. So we have a perfect portrait of a sweet young maiden who is you know, coming with a great dowry, the perfect future wife for a Renaissance husband. Raphael continued to develop, not just in the field of portraiture, but in the field of devotional works. And these two types of works, the producing of the production of portraits and the production of these Madonna and child images, these go in people's houses. And these are incredibly successful works. There are a lot of wealthy families in Florence and in Byron's. They want portraits of their family members and they want pretty little devotional images to go in their houses. And so Raphael, a smart man building up a studio, begins to develop a style for both portraiture and devotional works that will be incredibly successful. And they will contribute to making him very wealthy and very successful. He starts out with this Madonna and Child, which is clearly inspired by Perugino, one of his earlier masters. And we see this nude baby Jesus gazing off. They're almost identical. They look like they're, they're twins, basically. And uh, even, though the, even though the face of Leonardo's Mary turns a little bit more three-dimensionally, the, the, the three quarters towards you, nonetheless, the downcast eyes, the little half moon eyes, the little rosebud mouth, all signature Perugino until Leonardo comes along. And when Leonardo produces the, um, when Leonardo produces these new, uh, this new of Saint Anne Materza, he creates something very, very different and really quite interesting. So this dynamism between the Anne and the bent, the, the bent over Mary and the baby Jesus gets translated into these interesting new devotional images that Raphael does, where we have the Joseph standing at the edge making one whole side of the triangle, his head comes down to Mary, Mary comes down to Jesus, who looks up at Mary as he rides this little lamb, and his foot 
comes out towards us. And when you look at Raphael's development in these images, you see that they're different. Each one is different and each one opens up a different way of interacting these figures together. And again, tremendously important step forward in his art. But uh, Leonardo is very, very helpful on the score of making uh, these portrait images and devotional images, which will help keep Raphael's business afloat. Raphael, however, wants to make it into what we would call the big leagues. And the way you do that is by making large format altarpieces. So Raphael's been working on altarpieces since he was 19 years old. It was maybe one from earlier, but from 19, he is producing altarpieces. The altarpiece on the left is Raphael's work in the Vatican Museums called the Odi altarpiece. And it, uh, it clearly has a debt with Perugino's altarpiece on the right, showing the coronation of the Virgin. As a matter of fact, it's the same subject matter on either side. What is very similar between the two are the way the upper part of the painting and the lower part of the painting are completely separated by a little line of clouds. It looks like a doll's house where you have a little floor here and a little floor here and the holy people are up on the top and the other people are down at the bottom. And they group together, so the, 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 the upper part of the painting groups together Mary and Jesus, surrounded by angels. We see the same technique of the heads with wings and a few musical angels or garland, garland draping angels on the right-hand side. So these two parts are clearly very similar. And for representing the heavenly part of the story, Raphael can really only lean on Perugino. Leonardo da Vinci does not like to show supernatural things. Leonardo's art is grounded in nature. So even when he does an angel of the Annunciation, the angel is planted on the ground. So in order to show these more heavenly scenes, that's when, we, that's when Raphael has to rely on the work of Perugino. Mm -hmm. For the earthly scene, however, Leonardo da Vinci shows him the way. If you look at um, Perugino's image, these figures, first of all, leave a big empty space in the center. They're all lined up in basically a kick line, whereas in the Odi altarpiece, Raphael puts the sarcophagus in at an oblique angle. And what that does is it forces the clustering of the figures on the left and they single out, they begin to lighten towards the center. He puts in the middle St. Thomas, who's looking up at Mary. Mary looks down at St. Thomas, and he's creating a flow of movement in the painting that we do not see in Perugino. He's guiding our eye around the image in a way that he has learned from Leonardo da Vinci, in particular from Leonardo's Last Supper. Leonardo's Last Supper was painted in Milan, completed in 1498. It's painted on the wall of a refectory of a Dominican convent. It's not moving around. It wasn't easy for people to go see. But the importance of this painting, which was recognized from the minute it was finished, was such that drawings and copies of this painting traveled everywhere. And for Raphael to have the possibility to study the composition of the 13 figures at Jesus's last supper with the apostles is what will be the springboard of his greatest compositions in Rome. Leonardo creating this painting, which had been done a hundred times before, every refectory in Northern Italy. What are we going to paint on the wall where the monks have supper? We're going to paint the last supper. So my Leonardo goes into this project thinking about how to do something new. And he uses perspective to make a very interesting box. The walls recede with these four tapestries along the wall. The ceiling recedes with the reducing coffers, leading us to that back wall, which instead of being blank, opens up with three little windows, which of course on one, one aspect is just alluding to the Trinity. But more importantly, that central window frames the head of Christ. And it frames it with such light that Leonardo, who doesn't really like showing halos, again, if it's not in nature, if you don't see it, Leonardo doesn't like showing it, 
Instead of using a halo, he uses that pure light behind Jesus's head. And it's also a way of transposing the scene in the foreground, which is leading towards Jesus's passion, his death. In the background, we already see the light of the resurrection. So it kind of brings us between these two places. When Leonardo sat down to think about how to tell this story, he made a very important decision. Given that many things happened during the period of that supper, from the washing of the feet, from the institution of the Eucharist, to the betrayal, to the conversations, Leonardo chose to take what for him was the greatest psychological moment among the 13 men. And that is the moment that Jesus, in the middle of a very quiet, normal meal, says, one of you will betray me. And that way that Leonardo paints Jesus as an isolated triangle in the middle of the painting, you see him completely enclosed. Nobody touches him, the light in the back of him. And the first thing it tells us is it's the effect of Jesus's words, like a stone dropped in still water. You're standing by the edge of the pool. The pool is completely smooth. Someone drops a big rock in it and a huge splash comes out. That's the first effect. And as we look at that Jesus again, kind of sinking into the center, dead center of that painting, it also helps us to realize, to enter into that psychological moment of Jesus's loneliness. So he does two things with that. He focuses our attention and he creates that isolation. Then from Jesus's words, the reaction spreads through the painting. So on the right-hand side, again, part of that big splash where the water comes out with a violent motion, you have Matthew, his arms stretched out wide as he says, what, what, what are you talking about? And two apostles pour over his shoulders, one pointing towards his chest, the other one pointing upwards in a gesture that will become very familiar in the art of Leonardo. On the left-hand side, you have John who pulls away, but Peter thrusts forward. And as Peter thrusts forward to tell John to ask the master who it is, Judas pushes out into our space, coming a little bit closer to us, which is a traditional thing in the art of, 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 of the Last Supper. Judas is usually closest to the viewer, usually seated on the other side of the table. But Leonardo didn't want to separate Judas from the group. He wants to keep these beautiful patterns of three, this mathematical flow. Jesus, three apostles, and then another three apostles. So he came up with a brilliant solution where Judas would be part of the group and yet thrust out towards us. So he seems to be closer than the rest. On the far sides, on the far right-hand side, you see the two men who look away but with their hands, they point inwards, as opposed to the left-hand side where the three men look forwards and the shoulder of the man in blue draws us back towards the center. So it's kind of like watching the stone fall, the first splash, the ripples go out, and then we always get back, brought back to the center. We are always drawn back to the center. Leonardo revolutionized composition in this work. He revolutionized how to put a series of figures in a painting and have them each be an essential participant in the story. Raphael took this knowledge and he brought it with him as he began to get closer to Rome. He wanted to be working in Rome. That's where all the exciting projects were happening. That's where all the, Michelangelo had already moved down there. Bramante, his relative had moved down there. There was a lot of activity and excitement in, in Rome in the early 1500s. And so Raphael went to Perugia and took a commission for a woman named Atlanta Bayoni. And the commission on the surface of it didn't seem like much. He was told to do a lamentation and a lamentation would have ended up looking like the painting on the right by Perugino. A lamentation is the image of lifeless Jesus with a group of saints standing in a semicircle around his body. So he started work and started thinking, I'm not going to get anybody's attention this way. Everybody does images like this. 
So the same way Leonardo da Vinci had revolutionized Madonna and child images, the Last Supper images, the same way that Michelangelo had revolutionized the David imagery, the same way all of these great artists never left the subject matter the way they found it, Raphael, now 23 years old, decides to dare to do something different. He will show the entombment, the body of Jesus being carried into the tomb. He'll be using movement, something we don't see in Perugino's painting, the actual drawing of the body towards the left. He's going to create these juxtapositions, which are very much part of Leonardo da Vinci's world. Look at the face of the lifeless Jesus and the face of the man who's carrying him. You have the green heaviness of Jesus who is dead. And then you have the other man whose head is in the exact same position. But because of the effort it is to carry that body, you can see the blood rushing to his face. And then the arm of Jesus, which flops out as he feels with his foot up the stairs. We have a very... Mm, mm, informative figure on the left where we can feel his difficulty. This, this figure is countered by the young man on the opposite side who's holding the body effortlessly, which also comes from Leonardo's own words. Always juxtapose extremes. That creates a greater sense of energy in the contrast. So the man who's having the terrible time lifting the body and the young man who lifts with ease become brackets or bookends in the space of the painting. And in it, Mary Magdalene comes tearing in. She runs in with her hair flowing across her chest. And we see this magnificent detail of the live pink hand of Mary Magdalene cradling the green lifeless hand of Christ. And the final thing he did, which is also, again, very much part of Leonardo's world, is to connect Mary, the mother of God, and her son across the painting. Traditionally, as you can see with Perugino, Mary holds her son. She's the one who touches her son. But since Mary Magdalene is going to occupy that space, he separates Mary from her son. And instead, he unites them by creating the same empathetic experience. Leonardo, who spent so much time thinking about representing the psychology of the figures, who wrote about the purpose of the artist, who is to take the interior movements and bring them out into, into the, the things, the interior moves, the emotions of the figure and make them visible to the viewer. And so Raphael is learning from this by having this this, this parallel between Mary and her son, Christ. And all of this will result in the incredible commission to paint for Julius II, the disputation, where you see all of the elements he's learned from Leonardo da Vinci. Not 12 figures, but 60 figures, but each one drawing your eye towards this center, right down to the figure pointing upwards, drawn from the Last Supper. So Leonardo came to Rome while Raphael was in Rome working for Julius II. Actually, he came the year that Julius II died. Uh, Leonardo came in 1513 at the request of Leo X Medici, the successor to Julius II. And he lived in the Belvedere Courtyard. He lived in the Belvedere Palace, which is the building you see here on the right. And I think it's very significant to remember how important that Belvedere courtyard is to every story that circulates between the great art in the Vatican. It's there where Michelangelo and Raphael studied those amazing statues that would eventually bring them face to face in the Sistine Chapel in the apartments of Julius II. It is there where Leonardo da Vinci was living from 1513 to 1516, where most certainly he would have met Raphael, who was living and working on the opposite end of the courtyard. And so these two men who perhaps met in Florence, we never really have any information about them actually meeting. We have no account of the two of them actually meeting each other. But how can it be that they were stones throw apart and this encounter never happened? Furthermore, they had another connector. 
Bramante, Donato Bramante, the designer of that courtyard who was alive and kicking and building the new St. Peter's, the person who had introduced Raphael to Julius II, who had been in Milan at the time that Leonardo was in Milan. You have Bramante, might you have Bramante, Leonardo, Raphael, all in that Belvedere courtyard. Don't we wish we had some record of the conversations that took place? Leonardo spent his time in Rome, for the most part, perfecting his ideas about painting. And he was writing, and he was thinking, and he was commenting on what it is that makes a great artist. He was reflecting on, on, on a lifetime of making art and passing down information, tips, teachings to the next generation. And in the Vatican Museums, we have the one and only painting by Leonardo da Vinci in Rome. It is an unfinished painting of St. Jerome, which for many people would be, oh, why an unfinished painting, how uninteresting. But for us, in the case of Leonardo da Vinci, the unfinished St. Jerome in the Pinacoteca in the Vatican is actually is actually a kind of illustration of his treatise on painting. And when he starts, when Leonardo talks about painting, he says every young painter has to start with drawing. And so you see Leonardo working with this building up of the, the mane of the lion, this incredible skill this man had with a pen to build up lines, to make, to make with just a bunch of lines, bodies, animals, action appear. Here in the body of in the body of Saint Jerome, we see the work of a man who boasts that he dissected ten men in the treatise on painting. The the the, the way he draws the the ribs and the muscles and the cartilage of this emaciated fasting saint. We also see the technique of chiaroscuro, which Leonardo was particularly proud of. He claimed it was the fundamental technique for all painters. Chiaro means light. Scuro means shadow. And you can see him using the scuro to create the underside of the collarbone or the hollow on the inside of the neck. But then he uses the chiaro to paint where the light appears to reflect off the chin, off the collarbone, off the shoulders. And Leonardo actually complains in the treatise on painting that students are lazy and they don't finish their works in chiaroscuro. And you can see this little ribbon of light around the back here. And that's what he's talking about. Leonardo da Vinci is the man who invented the idea that models use of using the white eyeliner on the lower eyelid to make your, your eyes pop. He did it to make his figures pop against a dark background. And he talks about the importance of painting. He may not have actually completed that competition with Michelangelo, but he believes in painting as the most, as the greatest of the arts. And he talks about painting having communicability to all the generations of the universe because it is subject to the virtue of sight, as opposed to hearing, because you play a piece of music and the music ends. But a painting remains. And paintings don't need interpreters for different languages. Look at the Vatican Museums, where up until now we had 20,000, 30,000 visitors a day, all looking at those works, looking at them with their different languages and their different backgrounds, because this painting is capable of communicating to everyone. And of course, Raphael is the great heir to these ideas, producing the exceptionally beautifully constructed paintings, which are part and parcel of the legacy of Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo da Vinci in the Vatican Museums. He admired Leonardo so much that it's believed that in this school, so-called school of Athens, the image of Plato was in the, for the figure of Plato, Raphael painted the face of Leonardo da Vinci. I will tell you it is a disputed attribution, and yet somehow it's a very romantic idea that Raphael put his own portrait in on the right, Michelangelo's portrait in front and center, and then above him, the figure of Leonardo da Vinci. So that brings us to an end of the elusive, brings an end to the elusive Leonardo. And we will be concluding this series next week with the might of Michelangelo. And we will see the grandeur of the art of the sculptor Michelangelo that together with the elegance of Leonardo that Raphael had already absorbed, catapulted Raphael into this extraordinary 
beauty that we see in the Vatican, Vatican museums. Thank you, and till next week. <laughs>